I guess the really important um, landscape that we need to be aware of is what's happening in the field. And we've had Rod, Rod Allen speak to us for a number of years, Rod, actually. It's been a long time coming, this transformation of BC curricula. And a really profound change in the way we think about how we educate young people in this province. Many, many influences have uh, come to together to, to create this transformation. Curriculum documents are now in draft form. They're now ready to be used. So this has real implications for us as teacher educators. We need to know what's going on and we need to be able to be the conduit to teacher candidates who are coming from a particular system, a particular way of learning and needing to adjust to a transformed way of teaching and learning. Rod Allen is particularly well positioned to speak to us about this, not only because he was really an engineer of the transformation in the Ministry of Education, where he was superintendent of learning and assistant deputy minister. But now he's, they had the courage to go into a school district as its uh, superintendent and CEO and make this change happen or facilitate <laughs> this change. No, just a small order for you, Rod. And he's going to tell us what that's about, not only from the macro position, what, what does this mean from the ministry's perspective, but what does it look like on the ground? in a fairly established district. And, um, and then we're going to have a chance to talk about that, those implications, what does what it's going to share with us mean to us as teacher educators. We'll have some table talk time after the break. So please join me in welcoming Rod Allen. I think I should be no, I think you need both. on. I need both? Yeah. Oh, I talk with my hands, so you're only going to hear half of what I say, because <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of this. Um, cool. Maybe I can just put this. Will that work? No. Um, thanks, Wendy. Um, going to make the change happen in my district. Cool. Uh, <laughs> not so much. Um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and, and spend some time with you and, and sort of talk about what, for, from my sort of varied perspectives, what I'm seeing um, happening in the field, both from my own district. I started there at the end of May um, and got to enjoy the June graduation frenzy. Uh, then we all went on summer holidays. Uh, so uh, tonight is my first board meeting. Woohoo! Um, um, I'll text you tomorrow, let you know how it went. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, and you'll see some weird branding on the slides because I haven't got around yet to moving stuff off. The minister, um, Minister Fassbender, was doing a series of regional tours, and so I've, I've stolen some of those slides for today. Uh, Jen McRae, whose chair is sitting there, who's the acting assistant deputy minister, she was my executive director in government, um, is hoping to come, but we have a brand new minister, as you know, and she's with him downtown uh, doing a bunch of briefings, so hopefully she'll arrive, and if not, I'll just talk like Jen and it'll all be good. Um, but I think I know that turf fairly well. And then what I really want to spend some time on is talking about implications. So, so what, who cares? Uh, what does that mean from a perspective uh, in a school district? What does that mean to teachers and classrooms and kids and learning? And then of course, what, how, that, how that impacts on, on you in that uh, teacher preparation uh, end of things. So yeah, as, as Wendy said, um, I was an assistant deputy minister up until May. Um, I went to government for two years, seven years ago, stayed for seven, um, and then finally, woohoo, I'm free, um, and decided to go back and, and try to actually do something, get, get my hands around some things and actually uh, try to do some of that work. I'm not very good with politics, I'm way, way, way happier with kids and teachers and classrooms and schools. Um, so just a little bit of, of uh, context setting, uh, I'll know you know all this is when your head slump uh, and, and you fall asleep, so uh, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move on faster. But I just want to give you a little bit of context for the conversation. And it's a, it's a conversation that's happening not just in British Columbia, not just in Canada, but uh, around the world. Every educational jurisdiction is having exactly the same conversation that we're having here today. How do we get our heads around all the changes, all the things that, that are different? 
So oh, I like to start here, uh, simply because it's something that most people don't know. Uh, certainly the public. If we said, how's BC doing? By the, yes, given the current metrics that we use, but how's BC doing? They would say, we suck. Uh, they read that in the newspaper every day. Uh, we're at war with our teachers. Uh, everything's horribly underfunded. I'm not going to argue that, yes or no, but there's all kinds of stories out there about how bad things are in BC. And yet, if you look at the data, uh, through the OECD data, um, this is a Conference Board of Canada view of that, um, it puts BC at third in the world. So that's pretty good. And we've been in that top five for at least five years, probably closer to 10. Certainly been in the top 10 in the world. So things aren't broken here. Could they be better? You bet. Things aren't broken here. We have, why do we get those results? We have spectacular teachers in this province that work hard every day in our classrooms with our kids. Absolutely wonderful educators. Same with principals and vice principals. Same with um, 59 of 60 superintendents. Um, everybody's working hard. In fact, some of the recent interest in British Columbia from the international community is based around that fact. How can we be seemingly so dysfunctional and yet have this amazing track record of, of actually solid student results? Um, and people are scratching their heads. There was a, a, a report that should be out any day, I've been saying any day now for about two months, uh, by Ben Jensen out of, out of the Australia, who came and looked at, at uh, professional learning in British Columbia and said, how can something that seems so disconnected actually be one of the most connected professional learning models on the ground that they've ever seen? And that's connecting universities, that's connecting uh, school districts, uh, a variety of, of um, other folks. It's kind of an interesting question. Anyway, we do pretty well. Um, the question is, are we doing well at the right game? And you've probably seen this video. I don't, I might even have shown it here before. This is Andreas Schleicher, who, who is sort of the chief data guy for the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, looking at international uh, education stats from across, he runs PISA. He's sort of in charge, in charge of all the data out of, out of those assessments, um, as well as some economic data. And he, oh, this is interesting. Oh, that's very tiny. Well, we need to reflect, increasingly reflect what is important rather than only what is easy to sort of assess what's easy to measure. If you look at the evolution of labor demand, at least in the industrialized uh, world, you can see that the steepest decline in the demand for skills is no longer on the manual labor side, but in what we call routine cognitive skills. Mm. The kind of things that are easy to teach, the kind of things that are easy to test, are also the kind of things that are easiest to digitize, automate, outsource, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing sort of a hollowing out of labor markets. On the one hand, you can see at the top end of the skill spectrum, people who can think creatively, who can think out of the box, who can integrate the knowledge of different subject disciplines. Uh, they're fine. At the bottom end of the spectrum, we're seeing declining wages, but jobs are quite stable. It's the middle part that is the war, the kind of things that schools have focused on a lot in the past. Routine cognitive skills, people, teaching people something and expecting that this something is going to help them later in life. But the test of truth is no longer, you know, what you know, but what you can do with what you know. And I think that's what we need to reflect in the kind of learning metrics of the future. That's a pretty profound statement. It's no longer what you know that matters. It's what you do with what you know, which means you still have to know stuff. Nobody's saying you don't, but that's not enough anymore. If you just want to know stuff, this thing knows more than you'll ever know. But it can't learn, it can't teach, it can't integrate in the same way that human beings do. So if you stay on the content only game, and I know we're not there, we're in trouble. Routine cognitive no longer is the game. And yet that's, what, what, what do we assess? A lot in, in big international assessments, what, what is it that we assess through FSA kinds of things often? We assess content. What is it teachers often assess in classrooms? We assess content. It's easy, we're good at it, we know how to do it, kids expect it, parents expect it. It's just not the right thing. So when we're talking about transformation in British Columbia, it's really we're talking about a cultural shift, we're not talking about a new curriculum. We're not talking about a new assessment model. We're talking about a cultural shift in how we think about learning, what we think is important. 
And that's exactly the conversation that's happening around the world. Exactly the same thing. Everyone's trying to figure out the new metric. How do you assess all that stuff together? Um, you will see, um, it was supposed to be done last spring, uh, but you should see uh, shortly um, an announcement coming out of the ministry around a new Science 10 assessment. It's up for grabs for a piloting. We know our worst work is, you know, is probably Science 10, a trivial pursuit assessment and a trivial pursuit course. And it's not science. We're teaching something else. We have taught generations of kids that science is memorizing facts when science is asking good questions. Science is getting your hands dirty. It, it's, it's struggling with why is the sky blue? It's all those kinds of things. Kindergarten kids naturally do great science. They ask great questions, and then they try to figure out the answer. So we're, we are also trying, in British Columbia, trying to figure out what those assessments look like, and yet still do things in a three hour footprint where you can do a bunch of kids together because structurally we're not in a different place yet. So you're gonna see some piloting of those kinds of things, and again, um, that's a conversation that's happening across the planet right now. How, well, how do you assess differently then? Um, I want to give you uh, just a quick shot of Yong Zhao. If you haven't had the pleasure of spending some time with Yong Zhao, uh, you should. You'll get sand in your ears. It's quite, kind of exhausting. Um, he's, he's around the province quite a bit this, um, this fall. Um, so if you get an opportunity, um, have a listen. He's got a couple of great books out, um, especially World Class Learners is the one that I, I it was his second to last one. I really like it, uh, Building Entrepreneurial Spirit in Kids. And in that, he's talking about, not about um, young business people, but a spirit of efficacy. I can change the world. I, I, I'm in charge of my future. I, I not, it's something that I'm just drifting in the stream. I actually have something to say about that and can control my future. We want kids with that sense of efficacy. Anyway, here's a, here's a minute of Yong. How do we prepare our children to have the talents, skills, potential capacity that will not be replaced by machines and not, cannot be acquired at lower cost. When we talk about multiple intelligence, it does not mean you are talented in all of those areas. This is bad news for you guys, okay? You cannot be great in every domain. If you were, we would call you God. You're not, so we, we don't call you that. So the thing is that if you are talented in one area, there will be some weakness in some other areas. So this is actually quite fascinating. So I, I haven't seen most people in this one. Uh, in this realm to be great in every domain. But also, of course, by the same token, if you're really bad at something, you must be good at something else. Basic desires and drive us, you know, curiosity, family, honor. But he also said, however, each person prioritizes this motivation differently. So we have a unique motivation profile plus unique talent profile. Our traditional education model is about fixing the deficit, is about you know, we prescribe a set of curriculum that we think these are the most important things you should know, that everybody should know. And if you know that, you're good. If you don't know that, we're going to fix you. So that's, that's the idea. It's called homogenization. <coughs> we do not look at individuals. We look at what we want. We do not look at what people have. That's what we do. And this model was designed to prepare employees for existing jobs. And now we know the existing jobs don't exist yet. I mean, they're gonna be gone, as we have heard from uh, uh, the Women's Council right now, just on entrepreneurs. We know actually the most companies will survive over 10 years. When a new entrepreneurs come along to create new opportunities. So those jobs will be gone, how do we create that? So we always underestimate our children in those two domains. One is underestimate their drive for learning. All children want to learn. Second thing we underestimate children extremely motivated. They want to do something. In our school, I sometimes find ironic. Say, well, how do you motivate children? You don't need to motivate. Children are motivated. And they want to do. Human beings are born with a desire to socialize, to belong, to be curious, and we need to calculate. So not recent, most recent researches engage children in doing meaningful things meaningful, authentic things that you feel you can't even take away from them. You know, no mastery, autonomy, all those kinds of become very important. You create that condition, they are motivated. Now finally, we need to think about education as a globalist campus. Our schools are not isolated anymore. 
Thanks, Yong. Um, so I think a couple of key points, and I apologize to Yong, we cut out uh, an hour and a half into a minute and a half, so there's some stuff missing around the edges you might have noticed. Um, but that notion of, of the purpose of schools to be, a, to be a homogenizer is really important. Uh, the idea of, of secondary schools, and you see that funnel that he's got there, and if you read his stuff or you hear him speak, he talks about the sausage maker theory of education. Is you put all those kids in with all those differences and specialties and, and areas of interest, and you grind out sausage so they come out more the same than different. Uh, which is fine if you all want sausage. If, if we're living in a world now where that's not the case, we want a whole variety of skill sets for our kids. Um, we don't believe that every child is the same. Uh, and the purpose of education maybe isn't to make them all the same. How do we rethink that? How do you have a system that actually magnifies students' differences? Can magnify their individual skills and abilities? Well, of course, still working on the things that they, that they might need uh, to spend more time on. So it's kind of a good challenge. Y Yong, when he um, has spent time in British Columbia, uh, challenges us in BC to really view our diversity as our greatest strength not as something that we need to struggle with. It's our greatest strength, it's, it's our best asset moving forward is the diversity of the folks that live here. Um, it means we're gonna get different ideas, it means we're gonna get different perspectives. Let's use that, let's not try to uh, homogenize it out. Um, so sort of some interesting ideas. You, you've got Andreas saying, um, same old, same old doesn't really work. We need to be thinking about different metrics. Um, we need to be thinking about the kinds of experiences we give our kids in schools so that it's, it's uh, not um, just knowing things, but it's doing something and doing something different with those things. That's the skill set moving forward. And, um, and Yong, again, talking about uh, diversity. He talks about, is that me? Is that just in my head? Because it happens at my age. <laughs> I find, I find that with my eyes too. Um, I think I'm looking at something and then I realize I'm not. I'm not sure that one's working. Yeah. Is that one going? Okay. Yeah. I'll use my PE teacher voice. Um, so some things to think about as, as we're moving forward around transformation. And I think those are questions that we're struggling with in British Columbia, those exact questions. So how do you do that? Uh, I'm gonna skip through that one of Yong. Uh, a few things, again, setting some context uh, that we have, and I'm not going to jump on Jan's turf here, but um, really, really important to us in BC is First Peoples Principles of Learning. An absolutely foundational document to us in the ministry when thinking about all the curriculum pieces that needed to change. And if you look at this list, it's a pretty stunning list. Um, and I like to put it up beside this one. This is the BC Educated Citizen out of the School Act. I know you've all read the School Act, right? Yeah, no. Um, this is what we're legally required to produce as educators. This is, this is what we're supposed to do. It's kind of a cool list. And you go, that, that's in line with what Andreas is talking about. That kind of lines up with what Yong's talking about. That lines up with what everyone in this room knows we, sh we should be doing. That was written in 1988. That was put in the School Act after the Sullivan Commission in 1988. And when we put that in front of a, a several groups of, of folks across British Columbia, their, their common answer was, that's great, don't change it, just do it. Don't ignore it anymore. You've been ignoring that since 1988 as a system. So let's not ignore it anymore. If we go back to the first people's principles of learning, in a lot of ways it's a, it's an, it's a different articulation of the same kind of sense of things. When I use this slide with international audiences, um, we had a group of Swedish educators, a group of Swe Swedish educators come in this summer, um, and they're not familiar with the term First Peoples. Um, so as you're explaining that, they go, but it, isn't it just people? Isn't this actually just everybody? Isn't this how we're all wired to learn? This is our D an articulation of our DNA. We learn collectively. We learn in groups. We learn through story and narrative. We learn intergenerationally. We don't learn in a factory. We don't learn in little boxes. 
we're wired to learn this way. So we've used this, uh, at the, the first activity that every curriculum team did in, in drafting the new curriculum was beginning here. And saying, so what does this mean? How, how do we think about that? Um, foundation, I know Jan's gonna spend a bunch more time, so I'm not going to. Um, but absolutely key to how we're thinking about things. Um, and back to the education, educated citizen. Just a couple of, I, I used this slide, at, um, I was working with all the public librarians in the province a couple of months ago. I was trying to capture for them a little bit about, about some of the changes. And I think it's exactly the same, you could put library instead of school, I think it's the same list. But it's a fundamental, sh some fundamental shifts in how we think about schools and how our parents and our communities think about schools. Maybe we've moved on, but I'm not sure we've articulated and, and had that conversation very well with everybody else in the province. Schools um, used to be about consuming stuff. We consume knowledge. Now we know it's about producing new knowledge. That's different. Used to be about knowing. Really now it's way more about understanding. Can you put things together in different ways? Do you really understand what you're doing? We used to think um, school was a place where we taught. Now we're pretty clear it's places where we learn. And of course, you need both, but it does change the conversation a little bit. Schools are places for learning, and we're all learners. Um, used to be way more about answers, now it's way more about questions. Having kids ask good questions might be more important than them knowing uh, the uh, places of the periodic table or the atomic weights of certain things. We used to believe that kids were places that we kept kids in. My first uh, uh, run around as a superintendent up in the Bulkley Valley, I would get phone calls saying, I just saw three high school students in, um, out in the street in, you know, on Main Street at 10 o'clock in the morning. Because schools where we, they, they, they got out somehow, go get them. <laughs> and I'm not as old as Bly, but I'm pretty old. Um, so, 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 you know, that, that actually wasn't that long ago. And yet we know that that's changing radically. Schools are far more like base camps. Learning happens outside of school as much or more than it happens inside of school. So it's about letting kids out when being a base camp where kids can go back and help make sense of what they've done out there, what they've seen. Still a huge role for schools, but learning happens 24 hours a day. And if you've got high school age kids, you certainly know that. Uh, it's happening at three in the morning. It's probably not happening at nine in the morning. Um, so in British Columbia, uh, we talk about three things supporting that educated citizen. Literacy and numeracy foundations, um, never, never not on that game. Kids have to know how to read. They have to be mathematically literate. Have to be, have to be, have to be. And we're pretty good at that, but not where we should be. We have way too many kids graduating with a dogwood, a real live dogwood, that have very suspect literacy and numeracy skills. Wait, how, how can that happen? Part of that is the structure we're in. We're in an assembly line structure, which is, well, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've got grade nine, pick a, pick a year, I've got grade eight, I can't really go back and help kids learn to read. Should have been fixed earlier, so that's not really my job. Or wherever you might be on the assembly line. So how do you get off that sort of assembly line concept? Anyway. Uh, it's a structural piece to talk about in a second. Understanding and applying of rich content. We've always had rich content. That's curriculum. The two new words are understand and apply. It's not know. It's understand and apply. That's different. That changes what happens in classrooms. That changes what happens as adults interact with kids. How do you get there? How do you... And then how do you assess any of this, understanding and applying? Again, that's challenging. Core competencies. Um, as Wendy talked about, uh, lots of work with folks from UBC. Um, Kim Schoen at Reichel was, was pivotal in, in some of this work as, as well as others about what are those skills and competencies we want our kids to be able to have, like Andreas was talking about, Yong was talking about, um, and, how do, and how do we make sure that happens? Well, we've included them in the curriculum, so it's not really separate from curriculum. We don't have curriculum and competencies, we just have curriculum. And embedded right in that curriculum are 
competencies. Everybody's job, everybody's job is to teach those competencies. And yeah, you're going to do uh, mathematics or physics or language arts or art or whatever it might be as well. It's hard, and we get that as educators. This isn't something new. Competencies, competencies are something brand new that dropped out of the sky. We've always done that as educators. And we've tried to include that in various ways when we're talking to parents or talking to kids. But it's, it's subjective. It's kind of muddy. We don't have common language. So new curriculum, having some common language to talk about that and think about that and talk to kids about that. We've always, again, this isn't something new. So it's not like, all right, I've got to teach math and I've got to somehow think of a way that I can assess um, collaboration because I need a collaboration mark. I know, I'll have a collaboration test. That'll be cool. A 25 question collaboration test. Um, have you talked to more than one person today? Have you, you know, what, whatever. Not it at all. But we know as kids are learning together, as kids are learning in groups, as kids are learning out in community, as kids are learning all over the place, they're living those competencies. So how is it that we can help articulate that? Huge amount of focus on competencies. Big difference between knowing something and understanding it. And that's the key piece of, of the transformation. The big difference between knowing something and understanding it. We have been a knowing jurisdiction, as is everyone in the Western world. We're not unique. Um, Bob McDonald from Quirks and Quarks talks a lot about why kids aren't going into sciences in universities, staying away in droves, Canadian kids. Um, why? It's not because our kids can't do it. It's, it. it's just that we've killed science. We've, we've taught them that science is something that it isn't. Science is memorization. It's all a bunch of crazy stuff. Um, and to be honest, in sort of a full disclosure uh, mode, uh, my son has a Bachelor of Science. Uh, got it uh, two years ago from a, an institution that's throwing me nameless um, uh, here in BC. And he, um, he believed that in high school, um, he felt a lot of sort of academic, not a lot of academic freedom in high school. You, you kind of toe on the party line. You need, to, you need to put out what the teacher's expecting. If you sort of stray away from that, um, there's some trouble. Um, my daughter, just to tell a, a story that I think illustrates that in grade 11 biology, or maybe it was grade 12 anyway, in a biology course, had to do a, uh, write a paper on um, vegetables in some way. I don't, I don't know the details. Anyway, <laughs> she wrote, she wrote a, great, a great paper and got a great mark on it but was deducted a bunch of marks because she didn't take it seriously enough because she had a bunch of yam puns in there because she was talking about yams a lot. <laughs> so sort of in her view, this, I've written a great scientific, you know, I've, I've done what I needed to do and I've kind of tried to make it, because it's, it's yams, like who cares, right? Um, she put a bunch of yam jokes in. Um, you haven't met my daughter, um, but anyway, a bunch of yam jokes in and got marks deducted and almost failed. Because you, that's not what you were asked to do. No, but I, I did what I was asked, and a bunch more. Anyway, don't get me started. Um, so uh, Keegan at, at, at BSC, he gets, he gets to university and finds less academic freedom than he had in high school. He was shocked. I thought I could come here and the world would open. I could debate. I could challenge. We would, we would get into it. Nope. Every year, teachers would say, well, maybe that's next year. Um, so he graduated, uh, got his BSc, and went off to become a, a commercial pilot, um, which is what he's doing now. Um, but he's got his degree, something to fall back on, says Dad. Um, <laughs> not literally, I hope. Anyway, um, so around the understanding and the knowing is something really, really challenging. It changes the shape of the classrooms. And when teachers are saying, I've got curriculum to cover, I'd love to stop and talk about that, but I have 5,000 things I have to get through before the end of the semester, we have a problem, a huge problem. And number one thing when we ask teachers, they said coverage. Uh, I have actually had a conversation with a f brilliant, fabulous kindergarten teacher who used the word coverage. mind-boggling. Um, best example uh, in the current curriculum, uh, grade two language arts, 92 learning outcomes. 
that you're, every teacher is required to teach every child every learning outcome. Yeah, good luck with that. 92 things in grade two language arts. There's probably five. Play nice, learn to read, clean up your toys. I don't know, like it's not a huge list. But we buried all the important stuff in with <coughs> Trivial Pursuit. <coughs> so um, this isn't what it looks like, it's now blue, but you get, you'll get the idea. I just want to sort of show you, the, show you the, the basic pieces of the new, of the new um, curriculum. Still draft, but with the ministry has given teachers complete permission to use this this year. So it's still draft, but it's, it's available. Uh, we've kept grades because teachers told us that. Don't take away the grades, our heads will explode. We're not ready for that yet. Okay, so we left grades. Don't take away disciplines or subject areas. Okay, we left those. Our heads will explode. Good? We'll leave that there if you want it. Core competencies. Thinking, communication, personal and social. If you, if you click on those, um, you'll see uh, exemplars, or um, no, Maureen tells me I can't call them that. They're, they're profiles, examples um, of what it might look like for a student at that age and stage to give teachers so, sort of some concrete stuff. Tons of video, tons of pictures, tons of, tons of work samples, all from BC teachers who were engaged in, in producing the competencies. Question around competencies, are we going to, how are we going to assess them? We don't even know if we are. Don't know yet. We need, to, we need to look at these things. Our teachers need to have time to play with them and figure that out. And, and I really hope ministries keeps its courage and says we, we still have a lot of questions that we, we can't answer yet. We're putting them out for use and we'll see. Let's, and then let's talk to people as they're using them, getting familiar with them and figure out is this is certainly something we need to talk about and communicate, but do we need to assess them? Should they appear in a report card? Who knows? We don't know. Different districts are doing different things already. Um, big ideas. It's, it's about <laughs> understanding. Um, I will sing in a minute. Um, no, I won't. It's a, uh, so big ideas. What are the three to five to six things that kids need to understand? Don't give me 92. Give me something I can get my hands around, said teachers. So there they are. And I'll show you a science one in a second. You might be able to almost see. Um, is there still content? Yes. But it's a list that might look about this long, not a list that's 92 or 50 or 40. It's maybe a dozen things. And there's still some things we want kids to be able to do. What should they be able to do? So in one page, and I had a teacher in my district because I was working with some of my teachers. Am I standing in the wrong space, place? Is that uh, part of the problem? Yeah. I can change, really. Um, is here's how we want kids to be. Here's what we want kids to understand. Here's what we want kids to know. And here's what we want kids to be able to do. Pretty simple, one page. No more binder. Binders are gone. Cheer now. Uh, so I had a teacher say, this is great, but where's the IRP? I want, I, I, I want the binder. And I said, we, we, we have a 12-step program for her. Um, but, but I think what, she, what she's saying is the security of all that other stuff is important. And I think as you're working with teachers, that, that's, that's part of it. The, the current teachers that are living in this world are going, I'm used to being able to... Um, I, there was a lot of support there. There's less now. Uh, or at least there's different now. It looks different. So how is it we support teachers through this? Um, and you'll see some buttons across the bottom. Those, those are, are yet to be filled in, but they will be click downs uh, and working with the BCTF and, and their PSAs thinking they should be owning these kinds of things. What are some instructional examples? What are some assessment things that teachers are working with? What are some resource ideas? Those kinds of things. That's not government's job because we're not teachers. Especially since I left, I don't think there's any left. No, there's a couple left, but um, right? Whereas in a more iTunes U kind of feeling world, what support do you need? So we're saying to teachers, while well, you're playing with the curriculum, tell us what you need. What is it you're, you're wanting to put your hand on you and, and it's not there? And then let's collectively figure out how we might fulfill that instead of trying to guess. In the past, we would have guessed. The ministry would have written a whole bunch of stuff, put it out in the IRPs, and some might have been okay and some would have been awful. 
So we're no longer in that world that ministry knows best. We know that uh, we, no, they, dirty bastards, uh, that they, um, that felt good, that they, that, that they know best. And so, again, another important thing to think about when, when we're talking about the curriculum is the fact that it was written by BC teachers. The whole entire, if you ever get a chance to go visit the ministry, I suggest you do, wander onto the fourth floor, my old, uh, my old world, and you'll look around and you say, so where is everybody? And you go, this is us. There are eight people in curriculum and assessment in the ministry. Last time there was a big curriculum change, there was over 100. There's eight people, which is actually a good thing because that forced us to do things differently. No longer did we bury people in the basement with all of Eddie typewriters in the dark banging out curriculum. Um, and we would bring a few teachers in to help us with that in the past and swear them to secrecy, honest to God. Oaths of confidentiality, this is secret squirrel. Governments rise and fall based on knowing what the learning outcomes may or may not be in grade four language arts. Um, to saying this time, it's almost all teachers. We, we sort of had a ministry person attached to each, each piece, but they were sort of more uh, helpers. And we went to the BCTF and said, we need a pile of teachers that are really good at this stuff. And they went, here you go. And it was a spectacular partnership and continues to be a spectacular partnership. The best, the best information about what's going on in the curriculum, go to the BCTF they, the, and w follow their Twitter feed. All kinds of good stuff about, about how to think about this. So written by BC teachers. Um, in public, share, we said. S share your struggles. Be clear about it. So we did a first draft and got a lot of flack from, especially our own one piece, let's talk about uh, science. So the K-9 science curriculum was Armageddon. We've stripped out all the environmental science. We don't care about the planet. This is just another neoliberal plot to, to uh, destroy the world or I don't know, whatever, a bunch of stuff. Um, and we went back to the writing team and they said, we thought it was so obvious and clear. We, we didn't think we needed to say some of those words because we thought it was so obvious. Obviously not. So uh, we were meeting with a group um, of, of a whole bunch of uh, science advocates and one of them finally stopped me and said, so what you're saying is draft means draft? I said, yeah. This time draft means draft. In a co-construction world, in a different kind of a model, trying to live the kinds of world that Andreas and, and Yang are thinking about, is we put out stuff that wasn't finished. And we knew it wasn't right. We thought it was pretty close, maybe 80, 85%. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's do another draft. Let's, let's put it back out again. Instead of saying, as we used to do, we'll, we'll, you know, shrink it's all shrink-wrapped and ready to mail out in the basement, um, and we'll consult about it. So no more consultation. Talk about that in a minute, too. Anyway, you can, you can see some of uh, these things. So this is, gr this is uh, grade nine science. Um, uh, four fundamental forces govern, our, govern the interactions of matter. That's an understanding. That, that's something big to get your head around in grade nine. No one's dumbed anything down at all. Uh, some things have moved around from grade to grade a little bit because the teachers writing it thought that made more sense from their perspectives. Um, second draft, some things may or may not have shifted back. Quantum theory is based on electromagnetic radiation behaving like both a particle and a wave. Wow, that's grade nine. <laughs> Pretty cool. Lots of content. No one's taken any content away. We have raised the altitude a little bit. So as a teacher, I've got to get at these big ideas. That's what my kids need to wonder, come to understand at the end of the year or semester. Some suggestions around content and some things they should be able to do. How I get at those, that's up to me. I now have some freedom to think about that. And especially true if you're looking at language arts and social studies and so on. So what we're seeing a bunch of teachers do uh, in a number of schools across the province is saying, when we look at this draft, it doesn't make sense to us to keep organizing kids in grades. We want to actually organize uh, differently, or we don't think it makes sense to organize in th the standard traditional disciplines. Because really when you look at the big ideas between social studies, language arts, science, whatever it might be, 
there's way more commonality than difference. So we want to organize around, uh, take those big ideas, move them around, and organize around some themes. Perfect. Other schools are going, nope, we're sticking with grades. Excellent. You can have it your way. It's going to get harder and harder to teach in the old way. I think in BC, um, like Bly, I, I'm a, I was going to say an old, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an old, uh, an old middle school teacher. That's where I sort of cut my teeth in grades sort of seven through ten-ish because I like crazy kids. That's why I could handle government for seven years. Um, it's kind of <laughs> like middle school. Um, is um, uh, lots of great teachers in BC have been for a long time doing amazing work in their classrooms. Often they're do, the, the ones that are sort of breaking all the rules are keeping their doors closed because they're breaking all the rules. If the curriculum police ever showed up, they'd be hauled off. Um, so as we're having these conversations, more and more of those teachers are opening their doors and going, you know what, actually, I've been doing it this way for 20 years. I've been, I'm, I've been reorganizing. When I was in middle, my first year uh, teaching grade seven with a principal who I loved and adored, still do, a spectacular educator, I had to hand in my timetable so she could count up the number of minutes and make sure I was doing the minute thing right. Um, that's how old I am. And um, I didn't and uh, she kind of came unglued and then I handed in a timetable that just had stuff written in every box. And she didn't like that so I put learning in every box. And by that point, she gave up on me. Um, because it's going to change from day to day, from week to week, depending on what we're focusing on, depending on what the kids are interested in. Um, so lots of teachers have been doing that for a long time. We're seeing more and more, faster and faster than, than we predicted, uh, teachers questioning a lot of basic structures um, because of the freedom and flexibility that the curriculum's given them. That's grade nine science. Again, there's still some content but way more about the kinds of things, and these are all competency kinds of things. A lot of them are involved around communicating science. Just knowing something's fine, but if you, if you can't communicate, talk about it, it's, it's, you, you can't do much with it. So, um, I'll blow some smoke at Mr. Frank. Um, we wanted to have an assessment conversation in the province. And as you know, things like FSA, um, is a very touchy conversation and everybody told us why bother having a conversation because no one's ever going to agree. BCTF is out here, uh, government's over there, um, Mary Ellen is a couple steps to the right of that um, and we said well let's, let's just try but again in this new sort of way of operating we didn't chair it. I didn't call the gr group together and chair it. Um, Bly Frank and, uh, and Chris Magnuson jointly chaired it and it changed the whole flavor of the conversation. Let's have educational leaders holding an educational conversation with a whole bunch of people at the table. Nobody owned it. We're just trying to figure it out. What can we agree on? And so AGPA, the advisory group on provincial assessment, AGPA 1 lovingly referred to, um, met and talked about sort of FSA, provincial assessments at sort of those not grad levels, everything below. And came up with a paper at the end of a year. Six meetings, Bly, eight, eight meetings, something like that. Six. Um, and guess what? They agreed. Everybody agreed on a model. Right now there's a group working trying to build that. C can we actually construct what, what AGPA envisioned? That's kind of cool. That's not what you read in the papers. Is we're all asking the same questions about how do you know? Anyway. Uh, AGPA 2 is, uh, is, is going and that's, uh, AGPA 2 is really focusing on uh, grad assessments. What should be, how should we think about knowing if, if, if kids are ready to graduate or not? What, what's that look like? Again, pretty open mandate. We didn't say what should the exams look like because that would presuppose there's going to be a bunch of exams. We didn't say should there be a math exam but not an English exam. We said so what do you think? And this group, again, Chris and Bly, do a magnificent job chairing it. Um, I think are, have, have landed. Have you, have you, there's a, a paper out or coming. Again, pretty cool. It's the system having a conversation with itself, not just ministry decreeing. And to be honest, that scares the crap out of government because there's a sense of lack of control. We're going to let Bly decide our future? Oh my God. <laughs> right? um, I know you share that fear with me. Um, uh, <laughs> 
but it's but it's so it's not government is a player in this, but they are not the owners. They're not the controllers, and that's a really different way of thinking about about government's role in this stuff. Um, so Jen McRae is obviously not here, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna boot through a couple of her slides. I'll leave all these with Wendy, and so you can see them at your at your leisure because I know we're 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 ticking along. Um, ready for use, kindergarten to grade nine. It's all up. It's all ready. Please use. Encourage your teachers to use. Some of it, in the stuff in the green is in a second draft, and the stuff in the blue is in a first draft. But it's still all up and ready to use. The stuff in the blue will have another rinse cycle uh, this winter, based on feedback. Uh, this will always be tweaked. We're no longer in a 12-year seismic cycle of curriculum review, like we have been in the past. Curriculum can get looked at holistically, because the other thing we did differently is we did everything together simultaneously. You can't do that, said everybody. Yes, we can. Um, because if you don't do it all together, you lose all the connections. You have to, you can't knit a sweater completely separately and hope it's all going to fit together. Um, so, well, at least I can't. I don't know. I'm not a knitter. Maybe you can. Did I get that wrong? I don't know. Okay. I guess you can knit a sweater separately, but you can't crick them. Um, because we want to make sure that it worked horizontally and vertically. And so we, we could do that with all the construction teams, always checking back. Is it working this way? across throughout a grade or an age and as well as vertically. So please play with it. Please look at it. Please use it. it just uh, uh, two days ago, I think on Friday, a curriculum search tool came live. I just was playing with it last night. Pretty neat. There's going to be a video coming out. Nancy Walt from the ministry just did a quick little video that sort of explains how it works. So you can go on to the search page and if you um, follow the BC TEF like I do, you can go find it. Um, I don't have the URL, but it's on the ministry uh, main page as well. And you can go in and you can look at grade four, all the big ideas, or all the language arts. Uh, I want to see the big ideas for a series of grades or whatever it might be. Or you can search keywords. Um, I, I want to know about identity as, as identity throughout all the, all the new curriculum or whatever it might be. So up and ready. Please play. That just says the same stuff. Uh, core competencies, all the core competencies are now posted. Um, there is a continuum of profiles, not by grade, um, for people to look at, comment on, think about, try out, see how it works, see what makes sense. Um, to be able to get their heads around what does creative thinking might look like, what's that continuum look like? Um, FSA, I think this is optimistic. Um, AGPA report, uh, we hope by shortly that uh, the, the working group will have built a model and we'll put it out so we can see some of the pieces of that. What, what might the questions look like? How, how are they conceptualizing that? A far more adaptive kind of design. Um, depending on how that goes, they'll start to build a model and October 2016, we'll do a, a province-wide field test. I'm hopeful, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's a year early. But it's good to have goals. Um, but you can kind of see the flow, of, the flow of things, and then by 2017, implement it. Um, grades 10 to 12, AGPA report coming out this uh, September. Uh, Bly says it's done. Um, Start playing around with secondary provincial assessments. Science 10 is half built. Conceptually, it's there. We want to float that out to teachers and say, so what do you think? Um, we're hopeful that by second semester, um, teachers can say, I would like to use that new assessment um, before they start the semester so that they can then adjust their teaching to meet the assessment. Because it's going to be f way more about scientific thinking, asking questions working collaboratively, those kinds of things. Uh, report cards. Um, you notice the only place cards appears is in the title because that's, you know, parents just want to make sure they have a report card. Um, I could talk for days about reporting. But um, new reporting guidelines to a new reporting order. I think it's going to happen here. So I, I, would, I would suspect by 2017-18 there will be an omnibus reporting order that changes the game. What, 
we all hope it isn't in that order is a new provincial report card. It will stay as guidelines. That's my hope. It will stay as guidelines. These are the kinds of things you should be talking to your parents about. Here's the kinds of, the kinds of timelines you should be talking to your parents about, you know, da da da. As opposed to something that we will all hate. Lots of conversations and really taking the lead from the field because the majority of districts are already not complying with uh, the current reporting order. They're doing things differently. David. When you're talking about order, is that like a ministerial? Yeah, that's, that's a legal. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it's signed off. It's law. Um, so right now we still exist under the old reporting order, which people are basically ignoring across the province and causing some grief for the politicians. So Abbotsford came out and said in the paper a year ago, we are banning letter grades. Instant microphone in front of the minister. Are you okay with districts breaking the school act? <laughs> he has to say no. And then the truck backs up. Um, where it's working across the province is districts that are just quietly working with their parents and doing something different. And everybody's happy. Nobody, not a lot of frou for about it because parents are going, oh, this is good. I, I like this. We have a district that um, um, parents said, we're good with a whole bunch, all that new stuff, artsy fartsy stuff, put it all in there, but just make sure I get a letter grade. Because only a letter grade tells me the truth. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so the district put a box in with a letter grade and literally every reporting term, they shrunk the box <laughs> until it disappeared and nobody noticed. <laughs> Not one parent noticed. Because there was so much other stuff that actually had meaning and actually told the story of what's going on with the kids. So all kinds of, and technology is an interesting friend here, electronic portfolios, all kinds of stuff going on there that, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So there's the big chart. This is sort of the summary of what's going on in the timelines. Um, green means it's in, is, is the current thing. So right now uh, we have a current reporting order. Um, we're developing new ones and then black is, is when it gets sort of implemented theoretically. So timelines are shrinking, especially around the curriculum. Lots of work to do. But even in the new world, there will be no curriculum police, just like now there's no, uh, one of my jobs in government was to be the curriculum police. That's why I have a black jacket. <laughs> um, and I was not uh, very good at that job. I want to be the learn, like, is learning going on? Yeah, it's a conversation. Anyway, uh, I'll leave that with, with Wendy. Uh, but I think those timelines will give you a sense of the kinds of urgency around getting teachers uh, prepared and thinking about this. So what's the ministry saying to us? Um, use it, use it, use it, use it, use it. Get it out there. That's what I'm saying to my teachers. Use it, use it, use it, use it, use it. Tr even if it's just pieces of it, try something. Just take one big idea and try it. Just whatever it is. You need to know what's going on. You need, you need to understand it. Um, just when it was in draft form, eight and a half million hits on the website. So a lot of interest, but we still have pockets of, place, of teachers and schools where they're going, huh, is there uh, something going on? So I think that's all our jobs to be talking about and sharing there's some, there is something going on. Um, in, do I put 10.30-ish, 10.25? Um, uh, I got this from UBC Archives, actually. Um, so I, I want to shift a little bit to sort of my perspective as a superintendent of schools um, in, in Cowichan and conversations that all my colleagues are having as well. And this gets to the Valerie Hannon out of the Innovation Unit, this notion of the split screen, which is we will always be pursuing doing better, but at some point you have to jump horses, and, and, and I'll just mix metaphors, uh, you're riding two horses. Um, You've you got to keep doing better but, but there's also a time when you jump and, and there's a double S curve of change and you're probably all familiar with that, no. Um, and at some point you, you, you have an implementation curve and it looks like an S. You start doing something, you're not very good at it, you're, you're trying, and then you get better and better and better at it and you're improving, improving, improving as a system. And then you get to a point at the top where you can't work any harder. There's, there's nothing left to squeeze out of that balloon. If you want something different, you're gonna have to jump. And we're right now in BC and then another S starts. So talk about the double S curve of innovation. So we are right in that gap right now. Some places have jumped, some haven't. And when you jump, things don't always get better right away. 
because there's a whole system learning new ways of thinking about things. So we're trying to scaffold that jump, but that's kind of where we are. Some places have jumped, some districts have, have clearly made the shift. Others are praying to God it never happens. Um, you, you'll sort of see it all. So we want to focus on getting better at things, but it also needs to be some new things. If you, if you want to get different results, you have to do things differently. So it's not just getting a little bit better. Uh, if it was, we'd just have bigger slide rules. Uh, I have shamelessly and without permission stolen three slides here from Dan uh, Pontefract. A uh, really interesting guy to talk to. He's written a book called The Flat Army. He works for TELUS. Um, and he is their uh, chief envisioner. So Dan's a futurist, uh, works a lot in, in organizational uh, theory, uh, as well as in new technologies. Great speaker, really interesting guy. Uh, he was at superintendent's conference this summer, which is where I stole these slides. And Dan's a Victoria guy, travels around the world doing this stuff. But so I stole three slides without permission. I will hopefully get permission from him before I share them with you. Um, and he asked us these questions, and, and, and I put them up because they're exactly the questions I started asking in my district um, in the spring when I got there. The BC Ed Plan is an opportunity to collaborate better between schools, school districts, districts and universities, faculties within universities. It's an opportunity to do things differently. You can't. I would say you cannot implement, if that's the word, I, I actually don't use that word, but um, if you're actually going to do what's envisioned, operationalize what's envisioned with the new curriculum and the transformation, you can't do it in the old boxes. You just can't. You'll drive yourself crazy. You can start there, but you have to start transitioning out. So is, this is an opportunity to rethink a whole bunch of structural things and do things differently. Uh, how are teachers and administration in your school really collaborating to achieve the mission? In my district, not so much. Teachers are talking, principals and vice principals are talking, not much linking it together. So I came in sort of in, uh, standing in the middle going, come on, we can, let's get a little closer, let's get a little closer, let's get a little closer. So, on our, so what's that look like on our, our uh, two day with principals last week, uh, pretty standard in most districts, we invited all the union reps to come and join us. Nothing, no mystery here, nothing, no secret squirrel stuff. And what did they see? They saw a whole bunch of, of educators scratching their heads trying to figure this out, going, I don't know, how, help me understand. So we had the double size of the room in there scratching our heads trying to understand. Perfect. That's the right kind of conversation uh, to, to be um, beginning. And we've started down a road in our district called management, I'm calling management for grown-ups. Um, if we just all acted responsibly, we, we would actually prevent a whole lot of craziness on both sides. Right? So what makes sense around student teacher, uh, parent teacher interviews? One, I hate the word interview because that sounds like the old days. Parents come in and they gr teacher grills the parents or the parents grill the teacher and uh, not much information is actually shared. So uh, in, our, in our learning conversations, um, we can do them very differently this year and we will. And uh, that was a bone of contention last year with the union. You can't make us to, wow, this, is, this feels a bit different. Uh, we'd actually like those conversations with the parents. We'd like to do it differently. So trying to stand in the middle and, and link things together. Um, because how are teachers and administrators between schools and school districts really working together? And again, we're not. We're sort of at that collaboration phase or sharing phase. We'll bring in a speaker and invite you guys to join us and vice versa. We're not really, I think, in one district to another. There are some examples where it is happening really, really well. West Kootenays would be an example of, some, of some, a place where some really interesting collaborations happening. Um, but we could do way better, and that's why it says really. Another gulp for a superintendent. Do you have a leadership model that's open to all? Is your leadership model akin to your collaborating model and what collaboration technologies are being used? huge for us in our district. We have a great tech plan, a solid, it's wonderful, it's rocking, um, maybe completely unlinked to our learning plan. And I would bet that's the case in 55 of 60 school districts. Which comes first, not the tech plan, the learning collaboration plan. Technology allows you to do those things better, so let's figure out what we want before we start buying a bunch of stuff. So good, uh, good question for us. And I like, uh, and Dan then went ahead and did this. Actually, that last slide looks like this. Do you have a leadership model? 
Nope. We have leadership. I don't know, we've talked about the model. What do we believe about leadership in, our, in, in Cowichan? Um, we all talk about teacher leadership. What's, what's that really mean? Is that just a fancy way of saying you're not getting any more money? <laughs> um, how do we really work and collaborate together differently to honor all the expertise people bring? Um, is leadership collaborating? Hmm. No more offices. Um, so in the school district in uh, June, uh, I brought all the itinerant staff together and kind of asked them that question. I, I hadn't seen it articulated quite that way and said, are we best organized in this district to meet the learning needs of kids or not? Could we organize differently? And they all went, oh yeah, we could do it differently. I said, good, let's do it differently. So we reshuffled everything. Because we had teams of teachers working in schools that never talked to each other. Pretty typical. We had uh, district people going into districts, working with a kid, um, thinking that's great, not knowing that another itinerant teacher's coming in half an hour later, pulling that same kid out of a class and, and doing something slightly different with them, et cetera, et cetera. Again, pretty typical. So just by asking that question, not telling them the answer, so how do you think we should organize? Well, we should be able to talk together more. We, we should, we should have, be far more collaborative in how we approach that. It doesn't make sense for two different people or three different people to be pulling the same kid out three different times when, when maybe we can do something quite different. Great, you guys go figure that out. I don't need to decree from on high, just ask the question. So really getting to a collaborating model um, and what more can support openness? How do we in our district be more and more open? Because we can't implement curriculum, if that's the game, it isn't really, but let's pretend, use the old language, if we can't implement the new curriculum, <coughs> we can't do all the things that it enables us to do if we keep doing our, if keep having our structures in the same way. And I think that's exactly the struggle that's going on in schools. So your teachers, your student teachers going out into schools that are wrestling a lot with that. And I think it's these, these four points. So the um, ISTP, the International Symposium on the Teaching Profession, it meets every year and it has been meeting in, uh, for about five years, uh, yeah, six years maybe. Uh, meets in the, sort of the top performing jurisdictions around the world. Get together, minister and union president. Well, that's a different conversation from all these folks across the world. BC uh, participated this year in Banff with jurisdictions from across the world. And the conversations are spectacular. Every year they put out a, a, a provocation. And this year the provocation was around innovation. Um, and so you, it's all online, you can find it. It's, it's a brilliant little piece. And so one of the things we've talked a lot about in our district is chapter four, which I've taken these four bullets from. Um, chapter four to, uh, on, on innovation says there's really, and this is according to the OECD, there's really four things you can do or that we typically do to think about innovation. One is we change pedagogical approaches. Oh, I know, we'll have our teachers do something different. That's the problem. We'll fix teachers. Spectacularly unsuccessful because it's not the problem. The problem is almost always the system in which we're trying to do the work. System issues. I know you don't have those at UBC. But, um, so we can do that and we tend to do that and systems tend to do that a lot but it, it doesn't really work. It's the better thing. If, we if our teachers were just a little bit better at assessment, that would solve the problem or whatever it might be. And it's usually one group telling another group to do something different. But really, they suggest there's really three things that you can do and they're all structural. And unless you get at those three, spending all your time up here isn't really getting us anywhere. You can regroup the adults. You can regroup the learners. Do we need to keep kids in age-based boxes, age boxes and move them along the assembly line like Ken Robinson would say? Is that the best idea we can come up with? How do you regroup them? What's that look like? Um, regrouping teachers. Do you need to have one teacher in front of uh, groups of 25 or 30 kids and then you just keep moving the kids along every hour? 
Um, is that the best? If you've got if you've got 25 teachers or whatever it might be in an elementary school, and you push them all into boxes and say go go do your teaching, or or can you can you regroup the educators in some way? And it's not just teachers, but regroup uh, the adults and rescheduling learning. Can, who said the best time to teach teenagers is nine o'clock in the morning? <laughs> we all know it's wrong, and we keep letting it happen. And that's unconscionable. If we were doctors, we'd all get fired. Because we know it's wrong, and we keep doing it, and we keep letting it happen. Why? Bus routes, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Adults like working, or, you know, they don't mind showing up for work early and getting off at three. Cool. But our teenagers don't work that way. And yet, if our schools are places of learning, not places of teaching primarily, we should be thinking about that. So the conversations, again, that I've, I've challenged my, my folks with in the district, is to start thinking about these things. And I don't know what the answers are, but I think I know what the questions are. What can we do? Schools within schools, how, how, do, we, how do we think about that? Does it make sense that a bell rings every hour? Just when kids are getting into it, you ring a bell and you move on to the next thing. Sorry, we're no, no longer doing math, we're doing socials, or whatever it might be. Um, Larry Espy would say the five by eight timetable was not invented by God. You can actually change it, you don't have to keep doing it. And when we look at, you know, WECTEP would be a great example, some of those West Kootenai districts. If you look at small rural secondary schools, they are changing everything. The action here isn't necessarily at the great big Uber secondary schools. Because it's really hard to change those structurally, uh, it seems. If you go out to Lucerne, if you go out to Eagle River, if you go, there's a list of places, Houston Secondary. Um, they are able to do things completely differently and it's working great for kids. What's that mean for teacher pre-service and the kinds of things that they're doing? Well, if you went in there thinking you're gonna teach uh, physics only, you're in for a rude awakening. You're not. You're having to integrate a bunch of things. So, so are, are you an integrator of knowledge? Are you able to, to knit things together in different ways, depending on the needs of the kids, and still meet the curricular outcomes that are there? So IBM talks about T-shaped people. A lot of common and then some deep specific knowledge. They've now changed that to talk about M-shaped people. Two or three or four areas of, of deep knowledge but a common piece across the top where you can integrate and knit all that stuff together. Is that what we're preparing our teachers to be? Because that's the world they're going into. Less and less specialization. If you, looked at, if you go to um, if you go to, last slide, if you go to um, most school districts, where's the growth industry in the school district? Well, let's put it this way. Who's losing kids and who's gaining kids in school districts? Who's losing kids? Anybody? What, what kind of schools or structures are, are, are kids leaving in droves? Standard secondary schools. They're opting out. And where are they going? to what we used to call alternate. Alternate used to be um, an island. You can sort of get voted off, right? You, sorry, you can't make it in here. We're gonna vote you off onto the island. And, and they were off ramps. And we said, it, uh, alternate schools are places where you go and then kids can quietly just disappear from those and no one has to feel guilty that they've dropped out. Horrible. Then we started the conversation in BC um, seven or eight years ago about talking about alternate schools as on-ramps. Those are places where you reintegrate great kid, kids into the mainstream. Let's fix them, Yong would say, so that they can play in the box with everybody else. Knock the edges off those kids. Now what we're seeing, the massive growth industry, is alternate programs as a parallel highway. Because kids are opting out of saying, you know what, I don't want to live in this five by eight timetable world. I, I just, that's too much stress or whatever it might be. I just can't do that. If I stepped over here into this kind of a program, I can get all the same stuff. I can learn all the same things. I can do it in a much more flexible way. I can do it integrated with my work or my job or my, my sports program or my whatever it is. Um, I can knit things together in different ways. So if you look at grad rates from alternate programs, they're starting to climb through the roof. Um, why? Because they're, 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 doing, they're providing a different service, a parallel highway. So in our district, that's the conversation we're having, is kids are voting with their feet. 
So that's blocks. Every time a kid moves from that high school over to there, every time there's a group of them, that's a, that's a block of teaching time that goes with them. And those blocks are streaming, and it's the same in every district across. So what's that mean? There's fewer opportunities. To we can't offer four blocks of Physics 12. Because guess what? The kids aren't asking for that anymore. They're asking with their feet for a different way to approach the physics curriculum in a much more hands-on, integrated kind of a way. So, how, so the, the game is, the question is, how do we get our secondary schools looking more like our, what we used to call our alternate programs? And there are some great examples of that. So again, who, what kind of teachers are being successful in alternate programs? Teachers that focus on uh, competencies, never lose sight of that. Kids first, how, how can we get that for you? What is it you need to be successful here? We'll figure that out. Um, flexibility of times and schedules, and teachers that are integrators. I can connect those dots. I can help you connect those dots. Because I, uh, I kind of, in my head, can connect those dots. Different kind of a skill set, and that's absolutely the growth industry. You, you, you pile d uh, distributed learning in there, and absolutely. The, the DL alternate world is eating the 5x8 timetable world's lunch right now. And unless those other schools start to shift, all the kids will end up over there. Do we have the teachers to do all that? that again, that's that integrator. And I think, you're, and you're starting to see it in schools. Um, hi, schools are changing and are starting to think differently. And it's not because teachers don't want it to, but teachers have to fit into the boxes that the school is in the ways the school is structured. And so that's the leadership function for the district, is to change the structure. So I've asked uh, all, all my, uh, for this year in Couch and Valley, these are the questions that we're asking for the year. Because I went around last spring and asked the principal these questions, and I couldn't get very good answers. And they're great folks. I, and, I, and I would, in my job for the ministry, I traveled around the province and got to do this kind of stuff, asked those kind of questions, and how's the learning? Pretty good in your school. Yeah, good. How do you know? Ooh. Hmm. Kids seem happy. Parents aren't complaining. Um, we, our FSA scores are, our district-wide rights are, and they go back to a bunch of assessments that may or may not actually give us any real information. And actually, they start to scratch your heads at that point. They go, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I don't know how I know. I don't, I don't really know how the learning is. And what are you doing about it? So for, for, for me in our district, those are the three questions for the year. We're going to spend a year trying to answer those three questions. How's the learning? How do you know? Because I would suggest our district, same as every other district, um, the fidelity to provincial assessments, the fidelity to a lot of uh, large-scale assessments is minimal. So that's not very good evidence. So how is the learning? Hmm, don't know. So let's try to answer that question. Um, and that gets back to Andreas and, and uh, metrics. It's not a better test of mathematics. What are the metrics? What are the things we should be looking for? So we spent two days, principals, trying to figure out, start the conversation of how do they lead conversations with their staff about new metrics? But what should we be thinking about? What should we be looking at? Yeah, okay, I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> I don't want Mandy to throw anyone. Yeah. Uh, that, that's amazing. You've given us so much food for thought. Uh, lots of things to scratch our heads about to understand, as you said. Uh, we will be discussing, and I think the frame of the double S um, curve of innovation is a really good way for us to think about how do we help our candidates make that leap, it's particularly with the school advisors, because uh, I'm thinking that that's what some of us are thinking about in the room. Uh, as well, for those of us instructing uh, methods courses, we're, we're right in that gap, and you've really identified that for us. So we're going to uh, puzzle over that in our groups. We're going to have some time to do that, and then uh, some time just to perhaps send a few questions or, or ask for some of your feedback, because you have a particular perspective uh, to lend to this. We're not going to answer everything, but we're going to, I think, raise some good questions today. And we're going to do that after the break. But it's all those other things. So, I mean, my kids are both. My daughter's still there one more year. Um, 
Daisy Gray. Great, like by every metric, Daisy Gray. So hard to get the of educators to stop talking about education. It's wonderful, in fact. While Rod is here and we have his expertise to uh, to help us uh, guide our own thinking, because this is by the beginning of I'm sure many conversations. Uh, maybe we could just hear a few ideas that have surfaced from various groups uh, that Rod might be able to give us some insights into. Uh, not the world that you know that that wasn't grade eight anymore. It was something completely different, and and has stood here so well over the. So there's lots of learning that happens there. How do we capture and talk about and communicate all that stuff? Not just Physics 12 and Social Studies 11. David. Do you have a sense of the, the, the faculty and the, and the faculties that grew out of the province, whether they had an understanding of, of, of this? Um, to David's question was about, about faculties. Um, of education, I guess, teacher pre-service uh, across the province. Yeah, I think this conversation is going on in every every faculty. Um, I know I've been a part of, of a bunch of them. I did a retreat with the, all the VIU faculty last year. Um, and we sat around tables much like this and we spent for two days, went through all the stuff and the changes. And, and, and then we sort of got to the so what, who cares conversation that they were having around round tables just like this. Um, they were talking about the content, we should change the content of our courses. We should make sure that we're talking about these kinds of assessment methods more than these kind of assessment methods and we should prepare kids for this and that. And finally one person said, if we believe all this to be true about kids, shouldn't we actually be structuring and teaching everything differently? <laughs> Spectacular. And so they're trying to do a lot of things quite differently. We want very different practicum experiences for kids. We were talking about this at the table. One of my hobby horses as, as a superintendent is, I want to hand place every student teacher in my district. Because I want them with the teachers they need to be with. And I know who those are. Or I, through my principals, know who, the, who those are. It's no longer random sh roll the dice. That's what it was when I was in teacher pre-service uh, back at UVic. And, and uh, all the comments from all the old pros was, I hope you get a good practicum. <laughs> that will make or break you as a teacher. I had two spectacular practicum experiences. Uh, it wasn't what I learned in university that made me as a teacher. It's what I learned in classrooms with teachers and kids. I could draw back on all that content and all that material. That was all good, but, but it was those. And I know colleagues of mine that didn't have those good practical experiences aren't teaching. So we know that 20% of people that get teaching certificates will never teach. And a further 20% will be out of the profession within five years. So we have a crisis of preparing them the right way, thinking about that first five years, that induction period into the world of teaching is abysmal. We give them the worst assignments in the school, right? What's all the junk left over that no one else will take? Uh, our best teachers, our most experienced teachers are teaching the grade 12 physics and math and those kinds of things that haven't seen a discipline problem in years because that's all been factored out already. They're not teaching grade nine where trenches perhaps one might say and so we throw our our young teachers into those into those circumstances um, we give them the same amount of prep time as everybody else that's crazy it takes we all know it took them twice as long to, we all we were there right you're up till three in the morning trying to do what an experienced teacher has done walking out to their car in the parking lot in their head because they've done it a thousand times okay? um, so we have to rethink that and we have to think that with our union colleagues when I proposed in a previous district I worked in that we should give double prep time to all of our first year teachers. Uh, because they need, and, and some of that's guided time with the principal, so some of that, it just takes you twice as long to do everything. And um, there's, we need, they need some time to work on some stuff because you know nobody comes out perfect. And the conversation uh, with the union came to be very quickly, uh, if there's something special for some people, it needs to go to the most senior teachers. I said, but that's not the point, they don't need it. In fact, maybe they should contribute some of their prep time to, to that didn't go over very well either. But, um, you know, you try some ideas. But we have to think about induction differently and we have to think about professional learning differently. So I think those four things, uh, one of the things we're trying to get to in our district is link those four things. Teacher pre-service, how, how, how new teachers are prepared, um, uh, the practicum experiences of those teachers in schools, uh, the induction uh, work and the ongoing professional learning I think are all connected and they are all great partnerships <coughs> with universities and pre-service institutions. Um,
but they're not separate pieces. They, they have to be connected together in really meaningful ways to change that first experience. So we're trying that, please. Last question. Oh, okay, so two things. One is um, I just wanna make a comment on the induction process for new teacher candidates. Um, in going, or new teachers going into school districts. The ministry has moved forward by putting out some money to fund a project called the New Teacher Mentoring Project, which you probably know about. But I'm just letting everyone know here that in certain districts in BC, it's growing, but it's not covering all districts, um, teachers who are beginning their career can work with another mentor teacher in their school, have release time, money for release time, to have them talk about what the mentor teacher saw in the classroom as well as the mentee uh, and them to work together. So there is a project supporting that. I wanted to point that out. But the other thing too is um, a lot of people here are FAs for the community field experience. Let me read some things that were up on the slides this afternoon. Um, letting them out. Think about the community field experience. Applying what is learned. Not memorization but application. It's not no about knowing it's about understanding. And then at one point, I heard Vanessa Andriotti, one of the professors here at EDST, say, expecting the unexpected. In other words, not having a plan that's going to go well. We all know as teachers that that's it. I'd like to propose to you that maybe the CFE is a step in the direction to allow our teachers to, and us, to see what it's like to teach in an environment that isn't controlled or structured the way that schools are and might open up our ideas of how maybe schools might operate in the future. I think those are, those are some really good points. So, so one, there, there are some, men, and many districts have their own or they use other mentorship kinds of programs. It, it's a great idea. But again, you gotta be with the right mentors and, and, and it's gotta be done in the right way. So it's, it, again, it's, I think it's something that needs, that needs um, a careful attention uh, locally. If you want a really interesting learning experience, and maybe you guys are way ahead of me on this, um, but go into a trades facility and watch apprentices and, and uh, journeymen interact and work. Go, go to a house, a you know, residential construction project uh, where, where you've got high school kids working with, uh, with um, uh, post-secondary young people and, and, a, and a journeyman, and watch that learning process happen. It feels different often. That it's it's a it's because it's rooted in a whole lot of different kinds of things. And and um, you know, I John Abbott uh, fr from Great Britain used to talk about cognitive apprenticeships. We need cognitive apprenticeships just like we have workplace apprenticeships. How is it that those kids that just really want to spark with somebody on something truly amazing get the opportunity to do that? Um, that's supported uh, and and counts and matters. It's not just something something off to the side. So I completely agree. Look at other other places where learning is going on, and see how that might apply to. Uh, and I just happened because we have got a huge uh, residential construction project uh, project going on with with Vancouver Island University, and you go in there and you watch watch kids in a classroom, and then half an hour later you go watch them out on the job site or or, or in the welding shop. It's completely different. The the methods of instructions and how those kids are relating to that is really worth looking at some different different ways of doing it. Yeah. Rod, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of everyone in the Faculty of Education, uh, give you just our extreme gratitude for coming today and really sparking the year for us. Thank you to Rod Allen. Thanks. I'd love to stay, but I'd like to say board meeting. I've given Wendy the double S curve slide. I, I, think, it's, I think it's worth a look. Um, and there's some literature on it if you Google it. Um, because we are absolutely, I think it helps put in context the, the world that we're living in. Riding to horse, split screen, imp, um, improvement and innovation. Um, I'll just keep talking as I'm going. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. We'll get that board yeah. meeting. Uh, and he's very generously shared his slides and the, uh, the videos that he shared with us today. So we'll put those on the faculty resources site. Thank you. Cool. All the best. Bon voyage.